So in this part of the video tutorial, then we'll go and have a look at how you can use various of the string methods to check, to see what's in the string, to check for certain rules about its, its contents. So we've already seen that in and not in can be used to check whether a simple string contains, whether a substring is contained within a string or not. Um, and then as well, we'll show you some other specific uh, tests you can do. So typically one would use in uh, in this sort of way. So if f o x in simple string, then do something. And again, as I said that um, in, in an earlier part of this video tutorial, you have to be a bit careful here because um, this is actually just testing whether the letters f o x appear in that order in uh, the string we're looking at in simple string. That's not the same thing as saying does the word fox appear in that simple string because, for example, if we had the word foxed or outfox, then this test would also return true, even though foxed and outfox are not um, the word fox. If you actually want to test whether the word fox is there, then probably what you should go and do is do the split first to get your list of words. And then when you use the in with that, you're actually testing whether the the string fox is one of those list of words you've found. And so that's um, now now testing whether you've actually got a match for the word rather than just a match for a substring. So again, sometimes you just need to think a little bit about what are the other possibilities there. In's all very well, but it doesn't tell you about where in your, sub, in your string can you find your substring. And for that, you can use index or find. They both work exactly the same way and do the same thing. So you just simply do the name of the string dot index and then the substring you're looking for. And then um, it will return the location of the first instance of that substring. Uh, and that's returned as an index location. So again, it'll return zero if the substring is right at the start. Um, uh, and so here when it's returned 40, that's actually the 41st character of our original string. And then the dot count method will count the number of times that a substring appears within the string you're looking at. So simple string dot count O tells us we have four letter O's in the substring. But I could do that for any any length substring. So I could do dot count fox and it would tell me one because fox appears once and once only in my substring, uh, in my original string. Um, there are then special uh, methods which can look at the start or the end of your string. So starts with and ends with. Um, and so you can check whether the um, starts with the word the, for example, which it does, uh, or ends with uh, dog, which notices it doesn't because of the full stop. Um, so although dog is the last word, the full stop means that it does not end dog, it ends dog full stop. And that kind of just makes a bit of a point about being a little bit careful with, well, both with starts with and ends with, because you need to think is, are there any characters in there that you wouldn't normally think about counting? So things like white space characters or new line characters um, or things like that, or indeed full stops. Um, so often it's good to use a strip before you use ends with or, or starts with just to make sure you know exactly what you're expecting at the end of that string. There are also ways of checking whether the string's just got digits or whether it's uh, alphanumeric, so if it's digits and letters, um, or whether it's printable or whether it's just ASCII characters. Um, and so here's a variety of um, ways of testing. So um, for example, we know that this string is printable um, because we can print it out. Um, it's not alphanumeric because it um, uh, has the decimal point. So it doesn't just contain the letters and digits. Um, it is just ASCII characters because we don't need to use any fancy um, uh, uh, non-ASCII characters in order to uh, represent it. So in other words, what we're saying here is that all its character codes are under 256. Um, and um, it's only it's not only digits, again, because we have a full stop there. Um, it would be nice if there was a, a dot is float, 
um, but there isn't. Um, and there is a dot numeric method, but um, uh, that's not actually what uh, it does. Is numeric does not check whether something is a floating point number. It actually just checks whether its, it's numbers are, uh, are digits. Um, the difference between is digit and is numeric is that is numeric is aware of Unicode characters that are um, uh, numerical like. So things like fractions and um, Unicode includes Roman numerals in it. And so is numeric will handle those. Um, uh, but um, it, what it won't do is it won't go and check whether something is a floating point number. So instead, uh, you can write something like this where you can write your own version. Um, and this is kind of the, the sort of recommended way of doing a test for whether something's a floating point number. And that is simply you try converting it to a floating point number. And if you can convert it to a floating point number, then you return true. And if you can't, then you return false. Um, and so it tells you, yeah, yeah 3.14159264 as a string can be converted to a floating point number. Um, so a couple of features uh, here. Um, so the overall style of doing this is, is what we call very Pythonic. So um, it follows a principle that you're better off to try and do something and catch an exception afterwards if you can't do it, um, rather than trying to find a clever way of checking beforehand um, as to whether it's possible and then doing it if you can. Um, and the other thing to notice here is the um, line where I actually try doing the conversion to float. I'm assigning float to a variable name, which is just an underscore. And traditionally, we use a variable name, which is just an underscore on its own, to mean, yeah, this is going to produce a value, but I don't care what it is. So it's a convention I'm using to signal to the other programmer that says, I don't care what the answer of this function is, although I know it does produce an answer. Um, and that's because all I want to do is see whether this, this function, the float function, returns successfully, not actually what the answer it got was. And as we saw a bit before, there's um, uh, you can easily go and combine these string methods together by simply just chaining them onto each other. Um, and so, um, for example, here um, I've um, written something which will do um, both um, a, a strip and then convert it to upper and then do a, a test. Um, so with this sort of way, you can um, uh, sort of go and change what you're testing on. You can sort of go through all the steps of preparing the string just in one nice line inside the if statement. Again, it's a way of avoiding having to have extra lines of code and extra variables being created if they're not strictly necessary. There is, of course, a balance here when you're writing good Python as to not make your line so massively long that you can't work out what's going on. Um, and so there's always a bit of a kind of a style balance here.